Why we have video, right? Okay, so you ready? We on? Okay. So today I want to talk a little bit about, we talked about hardness. I've mentioned hardenability, but I haven't really discussed why we have this need to do uh, hardenability. But it goes back to the same question a student asked me last year. Why do you have so many steels? Okay. Um, and um, I think Gary put this up on, on Stellar. But um, if you just go through a book on steels, you'll find uh, for the carbon steels, which we already know about, carbon, manganese, phosphorus, sulfur, silicon, and then these others, copper and lead can be up there in a very small percentage for corrosion resistance. That's back from the 1880s. People found that some steels that had a little bit of copper in them had better corrosion resistance than the railroads. So the railroads actually specified a, carbon, a copper steel, a copper bearing carbon steel with less than two tenths of a percent copper and double the corrosion resistance in, in basically the atmosphere. And then lead, when required, is sometimes put in steel for machinability. It forms little inclusions. Iron and lead don't mix. Um, and you form these little lead inclusions. And lead, of course, when you're machining, it melts. So now you've got liquid, liquid lubricant. Now we're getting away from lead as for what we call pre machined steels. Um, and they have, of course, ranges of, of all these different elements. This is just from a metals handbook that gives you um, the specifications. This is, that was for carbon steels. For alloy steels, you've got different specifications for carbon, manganese, sulfur, silicon, chrome, nickel, moly. I keep on going down. Tungsten, copper, vanadium, aluminum. So it gets more complex. And why do we have these alloy steels? Well. We have them in one simple sense because we have lots of different product forms, um, forging, uh, structural sections like I-beams, carbon steel plates, hot rolled carbon steel bars. This is actually if the steel salesman comes to you, he's got an order book and he can look up the prices for each of these in different classes. This is how they classify the steels. So there's, I mean, there's a, to go back down. There's a whole page there of different types of steels. That's the carbon steel types. And the alloy steels over here, just expand on it, you can have a line pipe. That's like the Alaskan pipeline. Oil country tubular, tubular goods. That's like the, uh, the pipe I brought in yesterday that had the, the, the defect in it that uh, leaked in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, steel quality, uh, special quality tubular goods. I mean, so there's lots of different steels, and it has to do with the way, partly what part of the steel mill it comes out of. Steel mills are huge, okay? They're, even now, after four years, whenever I walk through a steel plant, I'm still sort of amazed by the magnitude and size of the stuff. Um, the last steel mill built, Greenfield site built in this country, was built by Bethlehem Steel, the second largest steel company. Uh, it was the Burns Harbor, Indiana plant. Now I think it's owned by Arco Local. But that was in 1965. So we're talking 50 years ago. Since then, and it caught Bethlehem Steel paid about $5 billion and $65, which would be $15 or $20 billion today. Since then, the only there have been plenty of new steel mills built in the world because countries will build a steel mill because it's so important for their economy. What was the first thing, one of the first things the Japanese did after World War II? They built steel mills because they needed to build ships. That was part of their tradition and their culture. Okay, they're surrounded by water. Um, so they started building steel mills. Um, but since Burns Harbor, Indiana, no company has built a steel mill. Only countries have invested in steel mills because the investment is so big. The only people who can afford, and they have a hard time biting the bullet into it, to make $20 billion investments today in manufacturing capacity are Intel and Boeing. Okay? And that's what it costs. Well, I, yeah, those are really the only two. It might be a $10 billion investment for Pratt & Whitney or General Electric to design a new jet engine for an aircraft. But it's not a $20 billion investment. 
A new semiconductor fab, state of the art, is $20 billion. A new commercial, you know, 777, 787, $20 billion. It's a bet your company business, okay? Because you'll go bankrupt if you invest it. In, what happened? The 7, 747. Anybody know how the 747 came about as a commercial airliner? Hmm. The Air Force had, had a competition for the C5, with the Lockheed one on the C5A. The 747 was Boeing's design for a military airport. And they lost. And they said, well, what are we going to do? And in fact, the government had paid for a large part of that development, uh, design development of the 747. And Boeing, we got to make some money out of this. We've invested too much of our own money plus government money, and so they said, well, let's build a, a jetliner, a commercial jetliner, and everybody says, the world doesn't need one of those. I remember flying out of Tokyo once, and we circled just to get where we were going, the way we took off. We did a, a loop around the, air, the uh, airport, and I counted 47 747s on the ground, okay? They're sort of distinctive in shape. And, so, 47 just sitting there, and we weren't necessarily the first ones to take off. They kind of take off in waves, you know, on the international flights. Who says we were the first ones? But there could be 50 at Narita Airport. Okay, that's a lot of money. Right? Um, so anyway, and it actually was the savior of Boeing through the 1970s and 80s. So the 747 was a big cash cow. Um, in any case, there's lots of different steels. And one of the reasons there's lots of different steels without going through all these different types of steels and stuff is because of two things. The depth of hardening that you want if you're going to heat treat it and the cost of getting the alloying elements to do that. Now what do I mean by some of that? What, what I mean is if I just took a piece of carbon steel and I quenched it Remember that little thing I sent around with the file? That, if I quench that, this is, uh, this is uh, 1021 steel, okay? Which is close to, that was 10, 1018, I think, that I had. So the carbon content is 0.18 rather than 0.21. But the depth of hardness, this is, they take a, a bar like this, and they put it in a fixture, it's called the Jomini test, and they, they have a, a shield here and they spray water on it, it's a jet of water, as hard as they can spray on one end and then they measure, they cut the steel and they measure the hardness with a hardness tester across there. And this is the dis distance from the quenched end and this is the hardne hardness and you can get in a 1021 you can get maybe Rockwell C40 or 50, 45, 40, 45, but it drops off, this is in 16th of an inch units. So within a quarter of an inch, you can only harden that thing, a one inch bar, you can only harden that thing to an eighth of an inch. Even that little half inch square bar that I sent around, you quench that in water and you won't get full thickness hardness, okay? Because the transformation is just too rapid to form this martin site. But what we can do is we can throw some alloying elements in there and we can slow it down considerably. So this is what we call the TTT diagram. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. T temperature time transformation diagram for 1080 steel. This is 8 tenths of a percent carbon, and it's on a log scale of time, and it's on temperature. And up here, we austenitized to form base center cubic. We hold it there, and then we quench it down, OK? So the cooling curve would come down through here somewhere. This is one minute over here. Right here, we're at one second, okay, for this stuff to transform. This is a diffusionless transformation. It's athermal. It doesn't depend on a specific temperature. It's just a thermodynamic thing. The thing will, by shear, literally, the atoms shear and transform the crystal structure, and they do it at close to the speed of sound. Once you get a little nucleus formed, okay, Morris Cohen spent 30 years of his life looking for the martensite nucleus in the microscope. Never found it, it's about one chance in, a, in 
five million. The marker site million. nucleus, i.e., the site where the, the transversion begins. Yeah, yeah. There's there'd be some defects, and he even had a theoretical model of what how the dislocation should form a pseudo -stru crystal structure of the body center cubic, even though it was space center cubic. That dislocations could sort of put the atoms in a favorable orientation. That this would be the, the thing that we would first grow from. And he was he spent half of his career looking for a martensite nucleus. Never found it. Okay. Well, the idea of being if you know how a nucleus is formed, you know how to prevent it from forming, and you can get a way easier or much more hardness. Well, he was just a scientist. He was interested in just, you know. Just you know. <laughs> I mean, other people wow. win the Nobel Prize for doing something that might be useful. Okay. <laughs> other members just do it for pride. Uh, so anyway, this is, if I go to a 5140, and I can't remember what but this is probably got to oh, 51 is chrome, as I remember. Well, now, hey, I got two or three seconds by adding some chrome. It slows things down because chrome diffuses more slowly than, uh, than uh, um, just carbon and manganese and stuff. If I go to a 1034, which is a one third of a percent, I've got less than a second. I got. Um, the other was a 1080, um, and I actually have less than a second. It's impossible. We can't even measure it, okay? Uh, if I go to a 9161, I can get, if I forget that nose right there of this transformation curve, I uh, have 10 seconds, okay? Now, it can be a lot more than that, depending on the alloy content. But alloys cost money, and that's what I put up here on the board. Nickel, six and a half dollars a pound as of last year. Yeah, I just wasn't following. When you say you have ten seconds, what do you have ten if seconds? If you have ten now? seconds to get all martensite without it transforming to the soft phase, martensite forms when you quench. How quickly do you have to quench? If you slow cool it, it'll just go to BCC. It'll be a nice soft steel, <coughs> just like your bridge steel. Okay, sorry. And this is forming body center tetrahedral. Yeah, yeah. Trapping that carbon, keeping the carbon from diffusing. Okay, you form martensite if you trap it in those sites. Remember the little ping pong balls inside the basketball? That was talking about hydrogen. But you can think of the same thing: of carbon being trapped in its austenitic sites when it transforms, it forms a body center tetragonal. And if you can slow down the carbon diffusion, you can get martensite, and you don't have to cool it so quickly. Okay. Now, we did make alloy steels for Henry Ford and Alfred Sloan and General Motors in the 1930s and the 1920s, but we didn't have big plate applications until after World War II, okay? And one of the reasons is we didn't know we needed good toughness until after all the liberty ship failures. The repass part of the can form any kind of metal, right? No, just in steel, well, in steel, in some titanium and some copper alloys, but in general, martensite, 99.9% .9 of the martensite you'll ever be interested in is in steel. Other, other crystal structures don't have this, this ability to do this. There are other martensites and other things. Martensite is now defined as just a displacive shear transformation of the metal. The atoms just slide past each other uh, due to shear stress, okay, or internal shear. Uh, in any case, if we start talking about <coughs> nickel at six dollars and fifty cents a pound, or if I'm going to put one percent nickel, which would be uh, uh, 20, 20 pounds of nickel, that's one hundred and thirty dollars for one percent nickel. How much nickel is in HY80? Three percent, approximately. You're talking four hundred dollars. You just doubled the price of the steel by putting nickel in there, and you haven't even started to account for the chrome or the molybdenum or the vanadium that's in there. Now, chrome, we actually use ferrochrome, which is cheaper than pure chrome, uh, because we already got iron in there, and it's easier and cheaper to make this. So adding 1% chrome is only $20. Molybdenum, which is only in HY80 or HY100 at a level of half a percent, four-tenths of a percent, well, it's 180 for 1%, so it's $90 to add the molybdenum, okay? 
you end up taking a $400 steel and turning it into a $1,000 steel by adding alloy and all this. But now, instead of a sixteenth of an inch or, or an eighth of an inch of depth of hardening, I can harden a two inch or a four inch piece. HY80 is regularly hardened to four inches thick. Can be done maybe, well, probably not, up to six inches. Okay, but four inches what is about the max. What are you making with that thick though? Huh? What are you making with that? Oh, that's well, thick. Even the heavies. I'll give you an example. They were uh, they were using HY80 in the, um, this is Jerry, Jerry Milgram was a professor in 13, which is now, of course, 2M. But he was designing America's Cup yacht. And he called me up once, this is 20 years ago, and uh, they had a problem. They designed the keel, not the keel, but the, uh, you know, what do you call it, the, the uh, dorsal fin that's upside down, okay? The, the, you know, it's, right 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 right. <laughs> it's, a, it's sort of ventral, it's a center, center thing that keeps you from sliding sideways when the wind is pushing you sideways. It's not the rudder. It's the center, right in the middle. center board. Center board. It's the center board. Thank you. Okay. They were designing the center board. It was, it was uh, six inch thick and it was HY80. Okay. Or it may have been HY130. I don't remember. It was an HY steel. Because, hey, he's a marine engineer and he knows HY steels. And when they went on the first sea trials, the center board bent. Mm. Okay, a lot of force. Okay, this was not a. This was like five or six feet long and six inches thick, and now it has a big lever arm, right? But nonetheless, uh, they bent it. So he called me, uh, and that's when I first realized there were a couple of other faculty who were here at six a.m. Because he called me at six a.m. one morning and offered to hire me as a consultant to help them figure out how to weld. They're going to go to forty-three forty. Well, 4340 is got lots of nickel, chrome, moly, and vanadium as a alloy content, and I actually have because John Lippold, in his chapter on hydrogen cracking, has these same plots. For oh, here it is. Um, he has the same plot. For in quench hardenability, this is for this is the this is a uh, 046, so it's a 1046 steel. Typically, only has small amount. This is martensite, high hardness. Over here is ferrite plus perlite. That's what you get when you cool slow. And here he's got the same in quench hardenability for 4340. Okay, 40. Oh, that was 1050 up there. 4340 down here. And now you can harden to 40 sixteenths, which is three and something, but look at it. I mean, the thing, the hardness is <coughs> martensite, nearly 100% martensite, full thickness, you extrapolate this out, you can go to eight or 10 inches thick. So your question a little while ago, if you want to spend enough money and put enough alloy content in there, you can harden pretty thick. And in fact, there are some hardenable stainless steels that are 30 to 40 percent alloy content, you don't even have to quench them. We call them air hardening. And in fact, if you want to make them soft, you have to furnace harden them over several days, furnace cool them over several days. Because you just take out a big forging of, uh, of stainless steel out of a furnace, depending on its composition, and it just cooling naturally in the air, it will end up being quenched, and temp quenched but not tempered. Okay. So you can alloy things a lot, but now we're talking about, and when I said steel was $400 a pound, uh, $400 a ton, that's not really plate, where we don't have as high a yield. That's sheet metal for automobile, you know, carbon steel for automobiles, or for little red flyer wagons that your kids pull around, you know, okay? Cheap, the cheapest steel you can get, that rebar, $400 a ton right now. If I was talking about a alloy steel to make some bolts for some you know, commercial application, it might be $1,000 a ton. If I'm talking HY80 or HY100, I'm probably talking $2,000, maybe even $2,500 a ton today. It might even be $3,000 now. The price has been going up uh, in recent years, but it's not cheap. 
And then you add to that the fact that all your cutting, when you cut it out, you're not going to use everything in nice rectangular sheets. You don't get 100% yield in the shipyard. You got a lot of, after you cut the paper dolls out and weld them together, you've got all this scrap left over. The actual cost of pound <coughs> fabricated is about 10 times the cost of the material you started with. In fact, the Navy did a million dollar study down at Newport Goose. They were looking to um, uh, reduce the, uh, the weight of aircraft carriers and say, reduce the weight of an aircraft carrier. The Nimitz class carriers, which have been around for 50 years, and why don't we have a new hull design? Because it would cost $50 million, this was 20 years ago, to design a new hull. Before you even build it, just to design the shape of a new carrier is a $50 million bill. All the towing tank stuff and things. You guys come back to learn how to do these types of things, and they want you to do it for 50 cents, okay? Uh, uh, You'll have, you have a, a summer over at Draper or something where you get to design a show, okay? Uh, it probably won't be a Nimitz hull, but uh, anyway, a replacement for the Nimitz hull. We still have the Nimitz hull. The, the Navy made a decision about 15 years ago. Uh, you know, I'm sure that they could come up with better hull designs now than they did in 1960 or whenever they came up with the Nimitz class, but they decided they didn't have it in the budget to spend $50 million on just a new design. It was going to create all kinds of headaches when you further down the road anyway, as you learn how to do things. So they, but the problem is the Nimitz carriers, if you look at the history, we got a 50 year history, they gain 250 tons a year. I gain a little weight each year, so the carriers, okay? And most of it is not down the bottom, it's up top, right? Changing our combat system. So, hmm, all the way out of what system? A lot of the combat systems, whenever they're like, when they're they're not like in the major like RCOH overalls, like the intermediate ones, then a lot of times if they change out a combat system, you know they'll install the new one, and you know they they may remove all the components of the old one, but not usually. So there's all the extra weight of like different little bits and pieces, as well as the extra wiring and cabling. They don't want to take it out just in case something doesn't work. Well, and then whenever, you know, whenever it gets to, like, it's midlife, you know, they go through and gut it out, you know, right. just to remove all that kind of stuff. So, but if you just, you know, we've we built a lot of carriers for about, about one a year over the years. I think that's about, we're still, maybe it's one every two years now, but we were building one a year for, for many years. But if you bought them, okay, it's 250 tons a year on average. Uh, that's a lot of weight. So they, they were using, uh, you can get... Well, 36 KSI is the garden variety steel for guardrails on highways, and, you know, little red uh, radio flyer wagons, you know, you name it, just garden variety steel, 36 KSI. They, they can do through this, go through this normalization heat treatment that I talked about the other day that they were using at General Adams Quincy where they put it in a furnace and then they slow cool it rather than quench it and you can get a finer grain size, and that finer grain size in your steel can get you up to 50 KSI. And so there are marine gauge, grip gauge grades that are called EH32 or DH32, and the 32 is kilograms per square millimeter, and that's 50 KSI, okay? If you go to the structural welding code for bridges now, actually if you went to it in 1985, you would find A36, 36 KSI steel charts and you find 50 KSI steel charts. So it's not much different. It's not martensite. If you want martensite, you, you can get 100 KSI with martensitic plate, or 80 KSI and HY80. But without going to martensite, you could get 50 KSI. Well, and they did. The EH steels and the DH steels they were using after World War II, before I think the Nautilus was one of the first uh, HY80 subs. But they were using 50 KSI steel. Um, and I was going on some of that, I don't remember. But anyway, the the um, uh, the point is, um, you can go to higher strengths, but it's going to cost you money because of alloy. And oh, I was, oh, I remember. They, I was talking about the carriers. <clears throat> so they did this study. They wanted to go to 65 ksi with high strength, low alloy steel technology, where you cool the steel after as it comes off the rolling mill. 
red hot. But if you spray water on it, you can't quench it in water, but if you spray it with, it's more than a mist, but if you spray it with a, like a garden hose sprayer uniformly, you can cool it more rapidly, you can keep the grains from growing as big while it's red hot, and you can get 65 KSI. That's high strength, low alloy steel. You don't have to put as much alloy in there because you're getting, using fine grain size. It could be 100 times finer grain size if you do this. This is what I went over to, to Japan to kind of see if I could learn something from the steel companies in Japan, and the Navy wanted to invest in this. Yeah. When you say grain, it's just like a salt crystal, right? It's, enough, yep. it's a collection of uh, similarly facing metal crystals. They're not similarly they, facing. They're all random facing. I guess what I'm saying is like, the small, so what I'm confused, really asking the question, small grain size versus large grain size, right? Yep. So these are clusters of atoms that have all lined up and they're impinging upon other grains in the structure. Yeah, right? it's the difference between a snow cone and a uh, uh, slurpee. Snow cones have big grains and slurpee, you know, it's crushed ice. Sure. Slurpees have fine grains and you can suck it through a straw, okay. right? Does that make sense? Yes, so as it, as it, uh, you're basically chopping them while they're small. Yeah. Because you go out to cool on its own at a normal, normal speed. You let it cool on its own, a big heavy plate like that, you're going to get what we call an ASTM grain size of four, okay? With larger grain, or small, larger numbers of smaller grain size, going as the square of the number, okay? If you do accelerated cooling, well, if you do accelerated cooling, you can get grain sizes that are ASTM 10. So 5 to 10. You know, five. You take two to the fifth power and square it, or whatever, you know, or something like that. That's the number of extra grains you got, okay, per volume, per unit volume, okay. And then you have to cube that to anyway, to uh, to get the linear dimension of the grain. But your grains are much smaller. Maybe if I remember on Monday, I'll bring in a picture that shows you. I mean, you can have grains of you know at 100 x. You could have a grain that's that big of ASTM one. If you were ASTM four. You have the grain the size of a pea. And at ASTM 10, on, at 100x magnification, you'd have a grain the size of a period on a sentence, at the end of the sentence. Okay? Huge differences in grain size. The only thing you can do to steel, or any metal, basically, <coughs> to get both strength and toughness, which is what we want to do, is fine grain size. You add alloying elements, you're hurting your toughness but you're getting greater hard to build. Why do we do it? Because if we quench to martensite, it's smaller than that, that, that uh, the, grain, the effective grain size in martensite is so small that you can't even see it on a, an optical micrograph at 100x. You've got to go to the electron microscope. A lot of small companies are working on like these uh, crystal technologies where they basically kind of grow one crystal that is one single grain. Yeah. And so the whole point being that it's like a lot stronger and has special properties they need for electronics or whatnot. And for electronics like, and for high temperature in engines. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So my question is, is it just a, is it just a stupid question to say, well, what about trying to create that within a metal? Like, what is it about metal that prevents you from creating a single grain crystal oh. in any arbitrary large size of metal? We do it. I'll bring in, if I can remember, I'll bring in my single crystal turbine blade. Okay. Uh, we make single crystal turbine blades. If you want creep resistance at high temperature, so it doesn't flow like silly putty does at room temperature, if you don't want it creeping and changing shape at high temperature, you want a single crystal. Those grains, spine grain size at elevated temperatures is the kiss of death. Okay? And they go to make single crystals with no grain boundaries. They make single crystals in silicon because grain boundaries destroy the electronic properties, okay? If you look at, uh, I just bought some outdoor lights for my house that are solar powered. And you can see the solar cells have grains that are an inch across. I mean, you can see the grains on the thing just looking at it. And the grains, it's like a piece of galvanized steel bucket. You can see huge grains. That's because wherever you have a grain boundary, you're losing, I mean, electrons are being lost and you're not getting the the solar efficiency. So you'd love to have single crystal silicon for solar cells, but that's too expensive in general. Yeah, I'm guessing likewise it's just way too it's cost prohibitive, prohibitive to make large volume single single grain crystal metal. Oh yeah. To make single crystal metal, 
we grow it in a furnace at about a millimeter an hour, maybe two millimeters an hour. It's a little slow. But when you're selling a turbine blade this big for $7,000, and you're growing 24 of them at a time, unless you're Rolls Royce, they grow two at a time, but they have lots of small furnaces, whereas Pat and Whitney and General Electric use like two or three dozens on one, one sprue. It's like a Christmas tree with, with turbine blades on the end. You just break them off. <laughs> yep. Well, basically, yeah. It's what's called lost wax casting. But that's a different module. Okay. Uh, so anyway, I never did finish the story about HY, HSLA 65. So they wanted to go from their 50 KSI. There's a lot of 50 KSI steel on a carrier. You don't need 100 KSI everywhere. Actually, they, we've been using HY 100 on flight decks, which are about four inches thick. Yeah, that's not classified. Okay. I mean, you know, people don't have to have the planes are. <laughs> okay. You can calculate how, you know, what you have to have. The submarine hull is classified, but the flight deck is not. It's about four inch thick steel, and we've been using HY100 for 30, 40 years, as long as I know. Um, I don't know, it goes back to the original class of ships <coughs> because you need the extra strength, because you got big, heavy things on big, broad spaces and you know, the flight deck. But a lot of the rest of the ship is 50 KSI material. Could they save some weight by using HSL 65 because of the new technology in 1990? So they gave a million dollar, NAFSI gave a million dollar grant to uh, our contract to Newport News to figure out what, how much money they could save and how much weight they could save. And they found they could save 2,000 tons. Well, that's eight years of carrier, you know, carrier design and development without having to go to change your, this is when they're thinking about, do we need a new hull, or our carriers are getting so heavy, we can't keep putting them in the Nimitz, right? Uh, and they, they spent a million dollars and said, you can take out 2,000 tons out of a typical Nimitz class carrier, uh, and um, you, but it will cost you $10 a pound. At that time, the HSLA 65 was selling for $2,000 a pound, okay? $2,000 a ton. $2,000 a pound. Anyway, uh, but um, I could have told them that off the top of my head because I have a rule of thumb that the fabricated cost of a piece of metal, typically steel or aluminum or whatever, is the titanium, is 10 times the cost of buying the material. I gave you that little Defense Department 20, 21st century. That number is in there. Okay? I've been using that even before they gave the million dollar grant. If NAFC had given me the million dollar grant, I could have written them the report the next day, and I could have cashed the check. Okay. It's just that I always liked that report, because when I read the report, I thought, well, I've been saying this for years. It's 10, 10 times. And that's exactly what they found, okay, with their big, big accounting study. Okay. But the point is, with high hardenability, high, lots of alloying elements, lots of money, you can get all kinds of hardenability. Okay? more than we really need in anything um, we're going to build. I mean, you can make something 20 inches thick that would uh, have high hard to build. So we have lots of steels, but with all these lots of steels, we have all kinds of problems in welding them when they get thicker and thicker. And in fact, when Professor Milgram said, well, we want to use 4340, which was that one I showed you, very high hard ability, he said, we want to weld it. I said, mm. He said, can we do it? I said, if you've got enough money, you can weld almost anything. Not anything, but almost anything. And it turns out they did weld it, and I helped them. But you have to preheat it, not to 400 degrees. This oven, you can cook pizzas in. This is a 600 degree preheat for 4340. Okay? And that's not a very pleasant thing to work around. Okay? You don't necessarily wear blue, blue jelly suits, but you do wear radiation protection when you're standing next to that. And you have fans blowing air through your suit and everything else, okay? Um, not pleasant, can be done, needs lots of quality control to make sure they did it right, okay? Um, why are all these things, um, this is out of a book that you'll get when we do stainless steels uh, on weld abilities stainless steels, but it's useful in the sense it looks at the diffusion coefficient in centimeters squared per second 
in alpha iron and gamma iron, this is body center cubic, face center cubic, I kind of pulled this out for the hydrogen at room temperature, 20 degrees centigrade, or 1100 degrees, where we stress relieve, hydrogen diffusivity is 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 3. Doesn't change all that much. But look at the diffusivity of carbon. Carbon is actually fast diffusing, but at room temperature it's 10 to the minus 17. Okay? And if you look down here at tungsten, which we don't use, you have 10 to the minus 60. Okay? Hydrogen diffuses through steel just like steel 2 through water. Okay? How to bring a demonstration in like that? Oh, anyway. Uh, in any case, and then gamma iron, rather than 10 to the minus 5, is 10 to the minus 10. Okay? Hydrogen diffuses slower in, or fast, slower in gamma iron than it does in this, but its solubility is 10 times as great. At high temperatures, it's got the same diffusivity, but it's slow at lower temperatures. So, but if you look at hydrogen, it's just, it goes much faster. Carbon goes faster, 10 to the minus 13 versus 10 to the minus 20, 22nd, or uh, 10 to the minus 15. I mean, carbon diffuses fast through iron. I can slow it down by putting other things, like, like manganese has an affinity for carbon, um, or chromium has an affinity for carbon. And so the carbon atoms aren't as free to move. They like to stay near their neighbors they like, the chromium atoms or the manganese atoms. Uh, actually, that might sound sort of facetious, but a lot of the computational um, metallurgy that people do today is actually getting down to the quantum level of, and it's not much different than basically how many nearest neighbors do you have that are chromium or nickel or whatever, and how does that influence the vibra vibrational jump frequency of the atom going to the next site, okay? And you can start to predict the rate of phase transformations, and that's all this is, is a phase transformation, okay? Now, if I go to the little Stop and Doty, which came out in the 1940s originally. I think of the 1940s. I say about the first edition. Uh, this one just says copyright 1987 for the fourth edition. But the first edition, as I remember, was, was in the 1940s. Uh, and Bob Stout was the professor at, at Lehigh, which was the big welding school at the time. But in the back of Stout and Doty, there's about 20 pages starts out with steel number one, okay? And it's ASTM A27, which is steel castings. And steel number two is ASTM A36, which is structural steel. That's the garden variety steel they make the bridges and, and stuff out of. And it goes all the way up, I guess I don't have it here, but the last entry is steel number 200. There are a lot of steels. They all have different weldability, and when um, people would call me up over the last 25 years and say, Tom, we got some steel, uh, we need a welding procedure, can you write us a welding procedure? All I would do is go to pull stout and dirty off the shelf, go back to the index in the back, find the steel, and it says right here, depending on the carbon content, and this particular steel casting is going to have a range of carbon contents, and it'll have a range of thicknesses because you only harden to a certain thickness, right, uh, for each steel. It will tell me minimum preheat and interpass temperature. This is how much you have to heat up the steel in order to prepare it so that the hydrogen will diffuse out while you're welding it in that thickness, okay? You remember the little video? They did a, a finite element analysis on the video I showed you of the hydrogen and two different thicknesses of steel, quarter inch and half inch, preheated and non-preheated, and how fast the hydrogen diffused through when you welded on it. And you know, you can go back and watch that, but you'll find this is basically just a 1940s table version of what to do. And so I look up the steel, I'd say, what's the thickness and what's the chemical composition of the steel? There's a firm out here that does a lot of architectural work. For example, they were working on um, the uh, Charles Street MBTA station, built in 1910, mm -hmm. okay? When they didn't even have steel specifications back then for some of the steels they were using, but they had to weld to some of these things when they're rebuilding the <coughs> So they say, hey, 
okay, here's a, you know, they, they got to know that uh, for 500 bucks I would write them a welding procedure um, if they told me the chemical composition and the thickness of the steel they were welding. That's all I really needed to know. Well, here's the chemical composition and here's the thickness. And I would go to this book, and I actually even told them this once, but they never wanted to learn how to do it. They really wanted to pay me the 500 bucks, okay? It took me five minutes, I made 500 bucks for five minutes work, okay? Uh, and it will tell me what the preheat should be, if you need a post weld heat treatment, and whether you need to peen it, which is hammer the surface to remove the residual stresses. Uh, post weld heat treatment would be a stress relief heat treatment. Lots of different welding procedures, they're right there in Stout and Doty. Now, in fact, we'll look um, probably next week at one of the welding codes that sort of superseded this, and there are other ways uh, to calculate all that stuff. Any questions? So now you know why we have lots of different steels, lots of different alloys. When you get into the railroad business or the automotive business, they'll sell their souls to give you a steel that's $20 less per ton, okay? Because they're making a million, they're making product of a million tons of that steel when you're in the automotive or railroad business, okay? So $20 a ton is worth $20 million. So they'll have a special steel that's just got, just for that thickness and that hardness, it's optimized, okay? Because you're talking millions of dollars for small amounts, tenths of a percent of alloy content. Okay, that's why you got hundreds of steels. Now, when we get to nickel alloys and, um, and, and things, you're going to find you can put all the nickel alloys on two pages, whereas the steel takes ten pages. And aluminum alloys takes three pages, okay? And it's just how much of these materials we use and how specialized it is and how many millions of tons we're talking about in, in shaving the alloy content. So let's go back, if you don't have a question, let's go back and talk about what happened with the Sea Wolf? So I'll pull up uh, this HY100, but oh, they were welding HY100 on the Sea Wolf. It was the first full scale uh, ship uh, submarine with HY100. They've been welding HY80 for years, decades, uh, 40 years, uh, and successfully for 30 of those 40 years. Okay? And the first 10 years were a little hairy. Okay? Uh, whenever they switch to a new steel, they have all kinds of problems. Even no matter what they do, they always find new problems when you go into full scale production. So uh, they were welding HY100. They had built two modulars. You know, submarines are built in modules, right? And so you may have, if it, we'll just say it's 30 feet in diameter, roughly, okay? And you've got a module that's also about 30 or 40 feet long. And they can lift these whole modules, which might play what? 500 or 1,000 oh, tons. Well, but the, I would know, I would know if I'm a ton. Okay, but it's, it's a lot. They're light. They're, they're, you have big cranes, big cranes to, to move these things. And they build them in modules, and that speeds up the whole production process and saves money. Um, they had built modules and put HY100 hull modules in HY80 of the steel, steel chips because they wanted to get the experience. In fact, my first student ever. John Galati was working an electric boat, and he was assigned the responsibility to build the first HY100 module hulls. Okay, not for the Sea Wolf, but for for the couple ships that preceded it. Okay, so what happened is there's always a range of alloy content. Okay, and the, it turns out the weld metal is not exactly this; it's modified to optimize for the weld zone. And you buy the wire from someone like Lincoln Electric, who's the world's largest uh, manufacturer of welding electrodes like these, and welding wire. Uh, when it's gas metal arc, it's just a bare wire, and you use argon shielding uh, for the wire. And um, so that NAFC had a spec, and it turns out the wire they got was what they called high side wire. It had higher hardenability because of higher alloy content, was met spec, but everything was on the high side. The chromium was on the high side of the range. The nickel was on the high side of the range. You know, everything was on the high side of the range, which meant that even though it was supposed to be HY100, weld, weld metal for HY100, 
which means they were shooting for like 110 or 150 KSI yield, because you want slightly overmatching weld metal rather than undermatching for fracture reasons. Um, they actually got something that was more like 130 or 140 KSI. This would have been good for HY-130 steel. And that meant you had to hold your hydrogen to much tighter tolerances. And typically, in a shipyard, you can get about four parts per million deposited weld metal hydrogen. And I will put up here this, which is, you will not find this in any book, this little table. This is a Tom Eager table, but it's approximately correct. Okay, If you search through a bunch of books and then did a little interpolation, you can come up with this. At full restraint, which when you build these egg type constructions, it's pretty restrained. That metal's not moving anywhere, okay? It's pretty stiff. Um, the approximate hydrogen, if you've got a 70 KSI tensile strength steel, which is like the 50 KSI you know, submarine steel of the 1950s, you can tolerate 30 parts per million hydrogen. That means you can weld with a cellulosic electrode and you're not going to get cracked. If you're 120 KSI, you could probably tolerate 10 parts per million. So they had a little leeway there when they were doing HY80, or an HY80 is actually about 100, 105 KSI in the weld metal, and you could probably tolerate things. And they had learned to get down to four parts per million, and they could do it consistently, and that was one of the reasons they were encouraged to go to HY100. Um, well, it turns out, they were really at about 140. This circle was getting bigger. Remember those three circles? We've got microstructure, you've got stress, and you've got hydrogen. And you want to keep all of these as small as possible. Unfortunately, we're using this Markstead structure is the most susceptible structure to hydrogen. It's the finest grain size, and I'm not sure anyone really knows exactly why hornacite's the worst, but we've done plenty of studies. And we have the worst type of structure, but it gives us some of the best toughness, and it gives us some of the highest strengths. Well, when we have higher strength, we have higher stress, okay? Because it goes up to the yield stress when you start welding these things and all the residual stresses from welding. And the hydrogen, what happened to the hydrogen? Well, they actually measured the hydrogen content. When I was brought in, um, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, and they told us, don't tell anyone. It wasn't because it was so classified, it was because it was embarrassing. They had this big problem. Okay. Uh, but as I remember, they had numbers in the range of 5 to 15 parts per million hydrogen that they were measuring in wells that they had taken out, you know, samples they had taken out of so, the seawolf. Um, well, clearly, if you look at this little table, and hey, if I'm at a, even HY 180, I can only write, tolerate two or three. I can't weld that stuff. Even with my best welding processes in the shipyard, I'm going to be down at, a, at too high a hydrogen level. I'm going to have to use higher preheats and everything else, okay, to drive the hydrogen out afterwards. Well, it turns out they didn't have a lot of data. They brought us in early on. Six of us, there were two of us who were individuals, and there were four companies. That, and uh, one of the individuals who had been head of welding at one of the big electrode manufacturers got bounced early on because he spoke to the press. Okay, so there were five of us left. But I looked at the data, and it turns out they had three different wires. Uh, I think the wire diameters were like 045 is the standard. Wire 16th, which is 063. Oops, 063. And what's uh, 332nd is 0, 0, 9, 0, what's 337? 093, whatever, anyway, whatever 332nd is. Uh, these are standard welding electrode sizes. And I looked at this and I plotted it, and it turns out I would see higher hydrogen on average. This is just a, a very crude average, the smaller the wire. And so I concluded it was drawing lubricant. Why? Because it should have less the smaller wire. 
uh, well, if they all, if it's inherent hydrogen in the weld, I mean, the, the welding process was, you know, the, they were using the same argon in the shipyard no matter what the wire size. But what's different about these? The smaller wires have a hard, higher surface to volume ratio. Okay? It goes as 1 over R. So I get more surface per pound of weld metal with a smaller diameter wire. And I saw higher hydrogen. And so I'm now telling you my report, which was not classified, but we weren't supposed to tell it to the press. And now it's 20, almost 25 years later, so who cares, right? But that was when I've said it to classes before. Uh, that was my conclusion that it was drawing lubricant that was on the wire. Okay? Drawing lubricant. When you draw the wire, you have to use a grease. Oh, from the spool. From the spool. Okay. In the, in the mill, and then you're supposed to clean that off. Well, really, really good wire today, not necessarily back then, they actually sky the wire. They draw the wire with the lubricant, and now, for an extra cost, they actually will put it through another wire drawing die that's, that's machines off the surface, basically. Just skips, you know, they call it skiving. Okay, they, they clean off the top thousands or two to make sure no drawing lubricant got, lubricant got down in little crevices or whatever, and that it got rolled into the surface or something to get even lower residual drawing lubricant organics. Uh, Lincoln Le Electric didn't like this, this theory a lot for the obvious reasons. Now, another question came up at that when I went to the second meeting down there in Crystal City. Um, they had two, two captains. And uh, one captain, they said, these two captains want to talk to you because they had all read the reports because we had put the reports in a couple of weeks earlier. And uh, they said, these two captains want to, want to talk to you. And so it's a big room. There are 50 people in the room. And uh, I went over in a corner to talk to these two captains. And they were introduced to me. I don't remember the names. They said, this captain is responsible for operating all those subs at sea. You know, and this captain is responsible for maintenance of all the subs at sea. Okay? And they wanted to know what they had to do about the two ships that had been built with these modules of HY100 in the hulls. Did they have to bring them into port and replace the modules in the hulls? Or did they have to derate them or what? Okay? By derating, you can't go as deep as the you know, the envelope. You can't go as fast or whatever, right? And I said, well, the good news is you don't have to do either. But when you do come in, you have to do more inspection, okay? And I told them that because of fracture mechanics, okay? Um, but they didn't prep me for this. I was sort of off the fly. If I look at the fracture toughness, and I know that the fundamental equation of fracture mechanics is the toughness is, is going to, must be greater than the stress times the square root of pi times the crack length. Well, we knew the crack length size of these things. They were all less than an eighth of an inch. I already told you about that, how the guy, you know, they were looking for eighth of an inch flaws by the regular uh, magnetic particle and everything else. These things were like uh, a sixteenth of an inch or less, okay, half that size. And I said, you don't have to do either one because the stress is whatever the stress is. And let's say that the stress is half the yield stress. I mean, you've got to have a safety factor. And so let's say they design, and I don't know what they designed the ship to, but let's say it's 50 KSI. It's got to be something like that or you're going to run into fatigue problems. Are you talking about the inherent stress of a metal due to joining, or are you talking about that plus stress okay, induced by the pressure of the ocean? Some designer doesn't even know how to weld, or the welds <laughs> exist. Just what average stress do I have okay. in that structure? Okay, this is the design stress. stress. Yeah. What stress? I said academic. You said design. Academic. Stress. Yeah. Well, it's not academic. It's the design stress. No, I mean, they call it the design stress. This is when the guy for, first pulls out a sheet of paper. That actually not a NAPC. They're actually getting some consultant to start doing this stuff under NAPC's guidance. And they're going to say, okay, we got 100 ksi material. We're going to design this ship for 50 ksi operating stress as the maximum stress that it should ever see in service. The actual stress it might actually see may only be 30 KSI, but we're going to design it 
and we're going to have nowhere in that structure that has more than 50 ksi because if we do we're going to run into fatigue problems you need a factor of two safety to avoid fatigue and commercial military it doesn't matter you need a factor of two so i just said okay if i take 50 ksi as my maximum stress that the thing should ever see and i know that the toughness of hy100 should be on the order and you have no reason you guys should know this 50 ksi per revenge it has very unusual units because it has to have the same units on this side of the equation as here okay it's just the way it works out i can i can actually do this in my head i did it in my head for them i didn't have free out of x2 is equal to square root of pi c 4 is equal to pi c 4 over pi is equal to c the critical fall size is over an inch okay there is no way these cracks are going to grow in what's it a couple of years before the ship comes back for uh, some overhaul not a major overhaul but coming in for some maintenance a couple of years no way a little sixteenth of an inch crack is going to grow to one inch in size and cause the, sh the ship to fail okay in that period of time but so they don't have to derate it but when it comes in you've got to go in and you've got to go on every time it comes in you've got to select 10 20 percent whatever of uh, those wells on the on the hull and you've got to do a, a very good inspection better than usual to make sure you know how big those cracks have gotten if they're at three eighths of an inch in size when you come in for that maintenance you may have to do some repairs but the odds are i said the odds are 16th of an inch flaws you do the extra inspection and those ships can stay out there until you're ready to scrap them and we'll never have to do anything but you don't know for sure right so you have to do something and in fact you certainly weren't going to send out your number one ship okay with when you knew it was full of cracks okay because if anything ever did happen it would probably fire the entire u.s navy at that point okay so uh, some heads have got a roll and you know it's not that the congress is dead okay they always accept themselves okay so that's that's what happened at seawolf and that's where fracture mechanics can tell you what do you have to do doing extra inspection is what you need to do uh, to give you a similar example anybody remember aloha airlines you've got to do something here for adrian of the aerospace industry right because other people during the school year could be watching this and they might be in the automotive business or whatever. Aloha Airlines, anybody remember? Is that the no. one that the window cracked? And, uh, you know, basically blew apart and uh, the No, Aloha, that was what you're thinking of is the Comet, which uh, was the 1950s. They had square windows uh, on this British designed aircraft, and they were flying them across the Atlantic in the 1950s, and they would just disappear in the Atlantic uh, because basically they were getting fatigue cracks from the stress concentration in the corner. You will not see square windows in airplanes since then. Okay. Aloha. Was Aloha or the, the top of the aircraft? The top point? half actually is more than more than 180 degrees. Top half section just blew off. Uh, the only person who died was one waitress or stewardess. Stewart. Sorry, not waitress. One stewardess wasn't belted. Everyone who's belted in survived. You know, 40,000 feet, the, the top blows off. I was impressed. Wow. that the whole thing didn't break in two. If you look up, a, if you Google low high airlines, there'll be a picture of it. It's a fairly famous picture. It's sitting on the ground, and over half of the, the top is gone. And it turns out what happened, this was like in the early 1990s or something, there are more fatigue pressure cycles in airlines in Hawaii than anywhere else on a 737. Because every flight, no flight is more than 40 minutes. The islands are all close to each other, okay, and you usually find bigger aircraft over to, so Aloha just flew between the islands, and it got 40,000 cycles in like the first 30 hours of life, 30,000 hours of life, or whatever, and typically a Boeing aircraft is designed for 100,000 hours of service, okay, and you figure out how many fatigue cycles you're going to get, well, they hadn't accounted for someone just island hopping in Hawaii and so they had accumulated more cycles <coughs> Boeing had requirements for inspection after so many hours and increasing your inspection requirements 
after so many hours, but it was for the fleet on average. They were taking averages for the whole world in 737s, not for Hawaii. Okay? Yeah, you're scowling at me. Oh, no, I just, I see the picture of it, and it's pretty crazy. Yeah, okay. Well, you, want to, you, can, you can show it to people here. Well, I tell you what, give it to me, and I'll see if I can post it on the board. I'll see if this works. See if my projector works. So there it is right there. <laughs> See, everybody's standing there on top of the aircraft. Well, that's actually in the middle. They're in the middle of the aircraft, okay? I guess I could blow it up a little bit. So and there are better pictures than these, but anyway, yes. Okay, it's, it's pretty scary, I mean, to think, oh, flying along and <coughs> the roof flies off like in a tornado or something. Well, it turns out, um, uh, Aloha Airlines was the fatigue leader, okay? And they had around the rivet holes and everything else. No techno no fracture that Boeing didn't know about. Boeing is very, they got some of the top fracture people in the world, okay? Uh, the guy who was, did, taught me fatigue and fracture was Professor Reggie Palou, who got his PhD here, actually his SCD here, and then he went off to Boeing, and then he came back here as a faculty member and specialized in fatigue and fracture. So Bo Boeing has, top-notch people, um, and they pay attention to safety. This was one where they kind of got broadsided. No, you know, like I said, only one person died in this particular accident, but it was sort of a wake-up call for how do you do your averaging of cycles, and you have to look at the outlier here, which was Aloha Airlines. They had a lot more. But they have the same type of thing, and their critical flaw sizes uh, for the sheet metal skin and stuff, I mean, it's like several feet. They had big cracks, okay? But no one was looking for them because no one expected them. They were kind of the outlier leader, okay? I do similar work over the last 10 or 15 years down here for Cape Air. Cape Air flies Cessnas. And they put more hours on Cessnas than anybody else. And so their head of maintenance, whenever he saw uh, uh, a crack or a problem that he had never seen before, he would call me up and he'd send me the part. And he'd say, Tell us what happened. And I'd look at it metallurgically and look at its fatigue or whatever it was and try to give my assessment. And then I'd have to write, typically it'd be a one page letter, sometimes a page and a half. And that letter, I was, I'd write it to him. And over the years, I learned that what he would do with that, he would send, huh? He would send it to Cessna because Cessna needed to know what was going to happen to all their other aircraft. Cape Air was flying more cycles, getting more fatigue cycles than anybody else. They were the market leader in cracks, <laughs> okay? And they would also send a copy because they had to report it to the Federal Aviation Administration, which turns out for that particular type of FAA, they divided up the work. It's in Burlington, Massachusetts, right up here, right across from Burlington Mall. And so um, I never actually had to get into uh, some sort of fight and I never really got direct feedback from Cessna or from the FAA, but I know from other things that happened that they were reading my reports, okay? You know, I was just doing a failure analysis of why it occurred, okay? And was it a stress concentration? Was it over, you know, higher stresses than expected? In most cases, it was just, it was really old, okay? And things wear out after time, and that's basically what happened at all higher airlines. Okay, so uh, one day we will finish steels, but hopefully, and I don't—I actually don't mind the comment about everything steel. I've heard that comment in years past. Okay, but a lot of this stuff does apply to things other than steel, uh, and we're almost done with hydrogen. If I hadn't told you a few stories, we could have probably finished hydrogen and steels today. But uh, believe me, it will start to go faster through the other metals because you are learning some metallurgical principles that apply to more than just steels, okay? It's just easier to kind of tell the story of steels when I'm talking to a bunch of people who make ships out of steel, okay? Okay.